Welcome to another edition of AV Rants. I'm Tom Mantry, Associate Editor of Audioholics. I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant, the show where we answer your questions about all things home theater and audio video. And uh, we are recording a day late. There were some lovely technical difficulties on our normal Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time recording time. It wasn't so uh, much a technical difficulty as was the, the ISP provided router and wireless mm -hmm. uh, modem or the modem and wireless router connected Motorola box just went, nah, I'm out and yep. checked out. I mean, there wasn't even any lightning, and we get lightning all the time here, <laughs> but there was none of that. It just stopped working, which sucked. Good times, yeah. So uh, a podcast with no internet is a difficult thing to do. Thank you to the folks who suggested other ways of getting around it on Facebook, uh, but we decided not to use any of those lovely suggestions and instead to just record the day after. Uh, so. That and the fact that I fell asleep at 10.30 yesterday because I was uh -huh. wiped out. <laughs> I don't know what <laughs> happened to me, but this week, well, first of all, it has been dipping down to like the, at night, it's been like the, it's almost gotten to freezing here. Mm -hmm. That's how cold it's been. And in Tampa, we don't deal with that well. That's not something that we, you should see them. You should see them, Rob. I had people, uh, today I was watching people walk down the street with scarves. I'm like, oh yes, it's 63 outside right now. <laughs> It is, uh, for you Celsius people, it is 14 degrees <laughs> right now. That's still kind of shorts weather in Finland. And I yeah, think most a, of Canada nice would day here. Yeah, and I consider that to be nice temperate. Uh, so, 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 yeah. Yes. Before we get into all our topics and everything, I did just want to mention, uh, folks have, of course, uh, written to us in the uh, time in between when we normally would have recorded and now. So to those folks who've done so, including I think we got at least one donation in that time, you will get your due next week, not to worry, but uh, the topic list that I set out on Monday night, that's the one we're going to try to hit, and there's no way we're getting through it all anyway. So uh, don't worry if you wrote to us very recently and don't hear it tonight. I will say all of you have been complaining about my video and the fact that uh, my camera sucks and all that stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I did a bunch of speed tests when I was when, after I got my modem fixed and everything, and it turns out that the problem is 100% my old ass Mac lap Mac Macintosh laptop, whatever. It's very old and it's kind of creaky and it runs on Steam, so it uh, it it's just doesn't go that fast. So once I get a new computer, which will happen. Never, but hopefully sooner than that, uh, we will uh, we will get our speed up and everything will be looking a lot better. And I'll get a new camera, and who knows? Who knows what kind of crazy stuff will happen? Now, first of all, we'd like to thank our listeners of the week, and this week we have Mike S. We do have one more donation, but that'll show up next week. Yes, Mike S. donated, and it's also hoping that SVS might run a Black Friday sale so that he can pick up an SB two thousand. Uh, do they do that? You know, I haven't seen a lot of you know, sales from SVS. Not that it's never happened, but it's not like a regular thing. Like, I, as far I as I know. can I, I, that's, a, that's a hope, Mike. We can all hope for Black, it. Black Friday is, is coming up right around the bend, so uh, no harm in keeping an eye out, that's for sure. Yeah. I usually try to keep abreast of what's going to be coming out on Black Friday, but without internet for like five straight days, I had... <laughs> I really don't care about anything anymore. It, and I'm still going through all the emails. I probably deleted half the questions that came in too. So I, I just it's just hundreds and hundreds of spam things, and it just all of a sudden it was nothing but hey, wouldn't you like to get a letter from Santa? I'm like, yeah, I would if he was real. Shut up. <laughs> All right, so thank you, Mike, for being our listener of the week. Mike uh, donated by going to the website, www.avrant.com, and clicked on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee and left a PayPal donation. It was really great. For him to do that. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate it. And if you would like a living donation, that's how you can do it. And uh, no way speeds up your question being answered, that's for sure. Because we do kind of take them in chronological order, uh, generally speaking. Uh, but it, if you do want to ask a question, you can go to the website, which I already mentioned. You can email Rob at uh, rob at avrant.com, tom at avrant.com. Twitter is uh, at first reflect for Rob or at avrant underscore Tom for me. Of course, we have our Facebook page, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast. That's all one word. And there's G plus and other places which, you know, they exist. So I think they're just my name, right? Isn't it Tom Andrew plus Tom Andrew or whatever? Yeah, plus Tom Andrew on Google there. Are you uh, Rob First Reflect, or what are you over there? Yeah, I think I'm Rob H. First Reflect. 
I think that's how it shows up. Whatever. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, right, I'm not going to answer you on Google Plus. <laughs> yeah, really. Good. Yeah, I, if that only ask your question on Google Plus if you're like, I really don't care if this gets answered, because um, it might get lost. Uh, Facebook's mm-hmm. a good way, and uh, yes. of course, email. I think would be yes. preferred methods of getting them to us. We will notice you on the on the website as well. All right. Uh, before we get into what we will be covering, which for some reason seems to be a lot about a very particular pro- projector. <laughs> Figured. That's uh, the theme for this week. From Rohan over uh, on Twitter, he uh, let us know that the Diamond Lux edition of Gravity will be announced for 2015. This is the Dolby Atmos sound version Yay! of Gravity, which gets rid of 3D. Boo. Yay. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Why would you release a super duper special edition Update the audio. It's not just that they added Dolby Atmos, which is awesome, but they're also doing a separate soundtrack where they basically have removed the score uh, so that it's more like space is actually silent and all you're hearing is maybe the breathing and the dialogue and they've taken all the music away, which is an interesting thing and probably won't be terribly impressive in Atmos since there won't be a ton of sound going (laughs) on. But, I mean, they do all this. That's great. I'm fine with all of that on the audio. Lovely. And then they for some reason, don't have the 3D video presentation in this release. And, and yet the one that's coming out in France, the Ultimate Edition coming out in France, has 3D and Dolby Atmos. Why Why can we not just have both? Because I, the French is still stuck on 3D and the rest of us have already outgrown it. That's but why. just leave it no. out there. To... No. Gravity is one of the few movies where 3D was actually impressive. So, yeah, I don't understand this decision. I guess it's so they can make us triple dip. Whatever. Just buy the French import and shut up. But I'm sure it has an English language dub. I'm hoping so. I'll bet you the English language version is only like Dolby Digital 5.1, though. Yeah, maybe. Bet it's <laughs> it's going to be something. That's what you get from ordering from France. <sighs> All right. Fine. A couple of quick comments. Jay, uh, recall, we've talked in, we were talking the last week or two about uh, 2.0 or 2.1. I think that was last week. And how yeah. originally that uh, there was a thought that 3.0, you know, the front three channels were preferable, but they couldn't do that because vinyl couldn't actually handle three channels. Well, he recalled reading some reviews of SACDs that included 3.0 channel versions of music from the 50s and 60s, Nat King Cole in particular, where the music really had been recorded and mixed in three channel originally, but rarely ever heard that way until these SACD releases. So we'll have a link up to that. That's interesting. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Well, no, it's interesting. I don't know. I don't know. I won't go to cool. I mean, maybe well, it's it's just, cool. If that's the way it was originally recorded, but basically no one had ever heard it that way before, it's it's you know it's just nice from a you know historical point of view to actually hear it the way it was recorded and mixed and envisioned. Whatever. All right, uh, <laughs> Nelson on Facebook. Uh, he's commenting a couple of things that we've been talking about lately. Number one, uh, he did reiterate the option of uh, power line Ethernet adapters. He uses one himself to fill in the dead zone in his house where the Wi-Fi signals are weak or very slow transfer speeds. Number two, we joked about how some speakers have nothing but a single resistor as a crossover. He thinks that we must have meant a single capacitor since that can act as a high-pass filter to protect a tweeter from lower frequencies. You're right. Mm-hmm. You're right. We were basically just joking. We were joking, but it is a capacitor. It's a cap. Yeah, there is such a thing as a single component, quote unquote, crossover. And you're right, it would be a single capacitor. So that's right. Fun times. Yep. Good times. Nelson uh, has also set up uh, live performance speakers and auditoriums for many years. He often uses high Q speakers that have narrow, high frequency dispersion. The idea, he says, is only have a, uh, a wide enough dispersion to cover the audience, but to avoid reflecting lots of sound off the wall, ceiling, and floor, so the sound is clearer and less energy is wasted. He thinks a similar type of speaker in a highly reflective home theater might also help, although with the listeners much closer to the speakers in an auditorium, fairly wide dispersion would, ha- would almost always be necessary. That's kind of what, anytime somebody gives us a high, highly reflective room, we start talking about uh, the Kef speakers mm-hmm. or stuff like that. That's what we're kind of trying to do there. Is those uh, coaxial drivers, the tweeter in the middle of the uh, woofer? You know, the idea is that 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 gives a more a narrower dispersion mm-hmm. and uh, 
kind of contain some of that high frequency information. Yeah, I so mean, if you else? go to the extreme with like, uh, you know, wide electrostatic speakers that really, really output no sound to the side and have extremely narrow dispersion, like it, it totally does work. It absolutely eliminates those sidewall reflections, but you do end up with a smaller and smaller sweet spot. So it, it does make a little tiny. bit. <laughs> it makes a little bit more sense when you're in something like an auditorium. The audience is quite far away, so even if it's a narrow dispersion, by the time you know, that angle, that small angle actually reaches the audience is still quite a wide area. But yeah, in a home, it's uh, it's tricky because we're not many of us are sitting like 50 feet away from our speakers. So right. It's, uh, wide, wide dispersion is necessary if you care that the seats to the left and the right of you uh, actually hear something kind of similar to the one right in the middle. Yeah. Not everyone does. <laughs> it's kind of preferable, but whatever. Who am I to judge? I mean, except the fact that I'm me. All right, Ephraim uh, confirmed that uh, J River Media Center with Grace Note metadata is likely the best choice for our friend Gabe, who is looking mm -hmm. for a multi-channel music HTPC solution. He uses a setup himself. He's able to organize everything just the way he wants it. He also shared a thread from Computer Audio File Forum that uh, really helped him optimize his library. We'll share that on. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely detailed, and since I'm not an avid user of JRiver at this point, uh, some of it was going over my head. I'm like, I don't really know what that code means or where I would be plugging it in, but uh, they certainly have some pretty cool suggestions for, I mean, if you really want to get into the nitty-gritty of exactly how your collection will look and exactly how it will play back and even doing things like, I want to make sure everything that's in two-channel only plays through this particular preamp and everything that's in multi-channel goes through my other preamp. If you have that type of setup, you can do all those sorts of things uh, even somewhat automatically. So pretty cool and powerful. Yep. Very cool. useful thread. He also offered a cheaper alternative, which is Media Monkey. It's, it's like eighteen dollars or something. It says it's slower and not as user friendly, uh, though, and they don't post nearly as many updates. So he still recommends J River more highly. Lastly, on I'll just mentioned uh, J River costs about fifty dollars. Yeah, it's not, I mean, really, it seems like that's if you're going to spend eighteen, you might as well spend fifty. <laughs> Uh, Robert, uh, we asked. Uh, we were talking about the bright uh, SVS LED lights on the front of their subwoofers that some people, I, we were saying, use tape, or some people, you know, they suggested. SVS even suggested you can take the amp and out and unplug the little thing. Uh, suggested that you're using light dims stickers. Stickers? They look well, more. Yeah. Uh, they look more professional than electrical tape, and they allow some light to still show without being too bright, and you don't have to disconnect anything or cut any wires, and they're on Amazon. And how much are they? They're like $6, I think, for, for a, a pack sticker? of them. Well, there's a whole pack of them. I mean, there's a need... gazillion of them in there. Yeah, and how many do you actually need? I know. Maybe six? So go in with like twenty. Five ninety nine plus $0.99 cent shipping, so, you know, $7. Jeez, for a sticker, do electrical tape. I am way too cheap to spend that. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. So we're going to go on to our questions from last week and then questions from this week. So let's talk about what we're going to talk about so that you can know what you're getting yourself into. All right. Mm -hmm. First, we have Cameron. He's going to ask the single most important uh, Dolby Atmos question ever and also has an acoustical panel uh, question. Bruno needs some uh, more help planning out his front projection installation. I think we already talked about him at least once. He has a lot of words in this. I have to read well, all that. Getting into speakers now instead of uh, just uh, projection. Yay! But it all ties together. Now, for that was last week. Those are the last few from last week. And for this week, we got Ian. Uh, he wants to figure out which projector and screen to buy. Jason shares some updates to his, th his theater and his question about using a seating riser as a bass trap. By the way, Jared has an awesome theater. I hope we get to post this picture on Facebook. I believe so. Oh, yeah, I believe so, too. Are you still there? Yeah. Okay. Monty uh, wants a recommendation for a small, cheap uh, TV. <laughs> I laughed when I saw this one. Rohan, uh, again, uh, asks how we're going to set up an app, uh, set up Atmos in our theaters, which is an interesting question. Now, this guy's name I would never have gotten from the spelling, but it's Hamunth. Hamunth. Uh, he's he wants to share multiple source uh, the same sources in multiple rooms and he's got a way of doing it right now. Uh, he's got his setup right now, but he wants us to optimize it for him, help him optimize it, which is an interesting so, uh, problem with a fairly easy solution considering how much gear he has. But it would have been a lot more difficult if he had no gear. Uh, Steve. <laughs> Has a huge basement, wants subwoofers and a projector. Don't we all? I want the huge basement. 
Dennis asked about cheap projector lamps, which uh, we are currently right now waiting for an answer from Ray. Ray gave me a uh, a link to a site that ha that he uses for re replacement projector lamps. Dennis, I'll tell you how I got my replacement projector lamp, but uh, hopefully Ray will chime in before the end of this podcast and let us know where he, what he suggested to me earlier because it was a pretty good link. I couldn't find it. Uh, Galen updates, updates us on his new den and receiver and has a whole house audio question, and we now have one... Two, three, three <laughs> reviews to tear apart, or things to tear apart. So there's a subwoofer review, a cable review, which I haven't looked at, and another product, uh, another product that's obviously designed by people who believe in ghosts. <laughs> I would sure love to be able to get through that subwoofer review, or at least one of these. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna have to do a review, with, a review of the review. We're gonna have to do another podcast. It's, yeah. it's not gonna be this week, but maybe next week. I guess <laughs> how we're gonna do that. All right, so here we go. Back up to Cameron. Mm -hmm. Cameron just wants to know, this is the single most important Dolby Atmos question ever, will AV receivers that can do Dolby Atmos decoding have a special light on their front panel? He likes seeing the true HD and DTS HD indicator lights come on, so this is critical. There is mm. a happy face on this. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the ones that are, I think, firmware updated, they will display it, the name. It'll say Dolby Atmos or something. Um, but I don't think there's going to be a light. No, at the moment, I, I look through all the ones that are on the market right now, and none of them have an actual dedicated little insignia light on the front of them specifically for Atmos. They'll bring up the double D Dolby sim symbol when you're playing it back, but you'll pretty much have to look at the front display, the thing that actually spells things out in text. And there it will say Dolby Atmos or Dolby Surround if you're using the new up mixer. Uh, but yeah, and so far, no specific indicator light. So, uh, you know, that's... that's yeah, it's you have to wait another year, Cameron. Wait yeah, another year to update. So, yeah, you know, these ones that, that came out and then had a firmware update afterwards. Nope, they didn't plan ahead. All right. Second and thing I care about. Uh, due to the layout of his room and aesthetic constraints, Cameron cannot put acoustic panels on his side walls. Okay, mm -hmm. but he can put th up to three panels on his front wall and three panels on his back wall. He really wants some acoustic treatments because the simple clap test re reveals quite a loud zing. So his question: He wants to know if he should just if he should add the optional scatter plate offered by Gig Acoustics. Should he add the scatter plates to all six panels, half of them, none of them? What should he do? Well, we should probably describe what the scatter plate is first. Yeah, isn't uh, it, the scatter plate? I actually look it up because I think I, I remember seeing it a long time ago. Isn't that you put it? It's like over the top of a regular panel, and then part of it absorbs and part of it diffuses. Is that how it works? Yeah, I mean that's the basic idea. They have their regular either two inch thick or four inch thick or six inch thick Bang. panels. Those are their absorption panels that they already have. Uh, normally those are wrapped in fabric and look quite nice. Uh, but they do also offer this scatter plate that you can put on top of it, which is basically just some wood uh, in a particular pattern that they've constructed it. And the idea is that that becomes a diffuser. So that is, they place that in front of the absorption material, but then they still put the fabric around the whole thing. So it's not like you're actually seeing the scatter plate and it does right. need to be built in, uh, you know, so you have to order them ahead of time. If there were, you know, a way to just add it afterwards, which I guess you could do, but then it would just be bare wood. So you'd want to paint it or wrap it yourself or whatever. But the idea is that if you're ordering ahead of time, it can all be built into the panel. So that's what he's asking about. And first of all, obviously, I would say get in touch with Gig because they have their free room analysis that they will do for you. And it certainly doesn't hurt to, hurt to help have their opinion on this. Um, but the way I would come at this personally, just looking at his room, which is sort of a medium-sized room, usually what you're going after is kind of a mix. You're going for a mix of absorption and diffusion. You don't want it just all nothing but absorption, because then it can sort of deaden some of the higher frequencies or the mid-range frequencies. Uh, but you don't want it all diffusive, because then you're not absorbing as much as you need to. So what tends to work well is to have absorption right behind your middle seat. So I would leave that one bare. I would just have a regular 244 panel, a four inch thick panel or something behind there. Uh, but if he's going to put three of those panels across the back wall, I would have the middle one be bare and then the ones on either side of it have the diffuser plates on them. Uh, the ones up front, I mean, the chances are you're going to have your TV up at the front of the room, right? So it doesn't really matter if you put a scatter plate on any of those. So I would kind of advise get 
like four regular ones and two with scatter plates and have the two scatter plate ones on the outside positions on the back wall, just so you have a little bit of a mix of uh, diffusion and uh, absorption. But that's just one man's opinion. I'd ask yeah. Gick. Uh, you could ask Gick. If it were me, I would just get absorption. Honestly, in mm. a room that's that's already that reverberant, I think I'd just be wanting to absorb as much as I could. Uh, okay, what Rob says right behind your head makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, the three panels up front, I, I really think that if you're, if, I, if I'm envisioning this the way I think, I, I see one behind each speaker and then one behind like the TV or above the TV or something like that. I think mm -hmm. all those would be just would be absorption anyways. Yeah. Uh, there's no reason to put any diffusion up there. You don't, you, you know, you want to absorb as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, and then for me, I want if your speaker's facing, you know, kind of pointing towards the back room, the back wall. You know, and it's going to be hitting one of those three panels. I don't really want any diffusion on that either. That's almost a first. You know, it's, it's not a first reflection point, but it's a it's a it's a direct line of sight, and mm -hmm. it's going to start bouncing from there. I'd say absorb that as much as possible too. So for me, my gut would be just get six <laughs> absorption. Yep. At the most, I would say two scatter plates. At the most, and then put them where they sound the best. I think mm -hmm. out of the out of the six, and then if you say oh, I don't really like these, then you're like okay, well then you just put absorption everywhere, and uh, you sell the scatter plates or whatever. But that's just my that's my sense of it. Uh, that would be my gut reaction. But then again, I'm not an acoustic expert, so you know, acutition is that word? Acutition. Acoustician. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm not one of those. <laughs> So yeah, that's having, what I would do. I would do all having stuff. some diffusion towards the back of the room does help a little, little yeah. bit, like your um, surrounds in that, because then it is scattering that sound. Um, so it gives you a little bit more envelopment. But yeah, yeah, we're both in agreement. It's like lean more towards absorption, and if you're going to do scatter plates, probably just two of them. So yeah, yeah, that's what I would do. Let's yeah. talk to Gang. Talk to Gang. <laughs> All right, Bruno. Last week we talked about what type of aspect ratio Bruno should choose for his front projection setup. This, this was is going two weeks ago now, wasn't is it? it now? Oh, whatever. <laughs> That's right. Two last weeks week, ago. We answered this last week. Yeah. Sorry, Bruno. This is going in a living room, not a dedicated theater. He has a maximum width of 116 inches to work with. We recommend that 110 inch wide screen. It's 126 inches diagonal. Thanks, Austin, who gave I guess apparently did the math. That's a 16 by 9 screen or 110 inch wide. Two. 2.07 by 1 constant area aspect ratio screen. But Bruno realized that if he installed a screen that takes up the entire width, he won't have any room left for his speakers on either side. He spoke with a custom installer. The first thought was an electric roll-down acoustically transparent screen with roll-down masking on the top. Of course, of course, the custom installer said that because that's going to cost an arm and a leg. Um, but Bruno saw the price point and thinks it's a little bit high. I think that's that's... <laughs> Probably an understatement. So if he sticks with the regular non-acoustically transparent fixed frame screen, the custom installer suggested the KEF CI203 QT motorized in-ceiling speakers. Also expensive to install. <laughs> Uh, these speakers can sit flush in the ceiling, but then they angle down when in use. But Bruno contacted Kef directly, and they highly recommended their CI200RR THX in-ceiling speakers, which they claim have such a high, uh, such good dispersion that they won't even need to be angled towards the listener. Oh, they're magical speakers. <laughs> Bruno was also thinking that he could just hang his current satellite speakers from ceiling brackets, so what do we think of these potential solutions, and what would we suggest overall? Can I just say, from the bottom of my heart, I hate all of these suggestions. <laughs> I hate them all. I don't agree with one single word that's been said to you, sir. I don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. The minute you start putting front speakers on your ceiling, I check out of the conversation. It's just like when so I, I'm in the middle of a conversation that says, God, I wish, I, 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 you know, vinyl's just the best, so I wish everything could come out in vinyl. I'm really? You're an idiot. So I'm going to leave this conversation and pretend not to talk to you anymore. Um, no, yeah, I don't agree with any of this. I don't agree with any of this. So first of all, you're not going to get a 126-inch screen because that's going to be custom and it's going to be too expensive. So you're going to go with 110 or 120 or 100-inch. What you're going to go with because it's cheaper. You're on a budget, just like we are. All right. So you're not going to go with one of these custom. You're not going to fill up every square inch of this thing. And when we get down to what the heck is his name, Jared, I want you to take a look at the pictures, Bruno, of Jared's theater and see how much room he has on the side of his screen and how his speakers are pulled out in front, and he has his screen takes up almost an entire front wall, and yet he still seems to have speakers in there and doesn't block anything. Your sight lines are such that 
you have a lot more room for your speakers than you think you do. Okay? You honestly do. So, there's two ways you can go about this in my book. First of all, get away from the ceiling. I'm trying not to <laughs> say bad words right here. Get away from the ceiling, okay? Get away from the ceiling. Get some, you can get regular speakers, floor standing, bookshelves, whatever. Just pull them forward, you know, until they're not in the sight line. And then sit, you know, sit down and go on with your life and never think about it again. You put a, ceiling, a, 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 a speaker in your ceiling or a speaker in your wall, you're stuck with that location. And if you don't like the way it sounds or it doesn't sound exactly right or it sounds like it's coming from the ceiling, then you're stuck with that, right? If you don't like where your speakers, are, you know, how your speakers sound, if they're real in-room speakers, you can change them or move them or tweak them or you know, uh, cheat them in or cheat them out or, you know, angle them slightly differently. Got tons of options, all right? Now, the second one uh, is probably, I'll let Rob say the second one because I know what you're going to say, so go ahead. The second one? What, yeah, what what's you your second, the second, second possible option for in-room speakers oh. would be? Well, yeah, I mean, one other way you could do this is just mount the screen higher and then have speakers under the screen if you if you're really worried about looks and you don't want you know vertical speakers kind of low and then the screen kind of high you can just go for three horizontally oriented speakers uh, position below the screen tilt them up a little bit just like you would any regular center speaker going below a TV tilt up a little bit and that works really well um, who who was it who uh, went with the pair of uh, Aperion center speakers you remember that oh right um, and we but, asked about it because he was doing yeah. uh, he was doing the he ended up going with the Sierra twos, but he mm. did a listening test because they thought that that would be the best speaker for him. Yeah, yeah. there's no reason but, you can't use center channels. They're just, they, it's just exactly. a name, okay? <laughs> it doesn't actually mean that if you take it out of the center, it somehow does no longer work as a speaker. It will be fine. <laughs> Put it to the side. It'll be fine. Yes. but I mean I, I don't completely disagree with the idea of an acoustically transparent screen, but. There's a couple of things to consider here. One, you, you were mentioning ones that are like electric roll down and then also have a motorized masking that comes Those in. Those things are like five grand minimum. They very often are. Yeah, the Seymour AV ones are like 3,500, 4,000, I think, for that. There's an additional consideration with that. Well, a couple of additional considerations. One, the masking is only coming down from the top. So that means when you go from 16 by 9 mode to 2.35 to 1 mode, you're going to need a projector that has motorized lens shift. No, usually the screen, the screen pulls up when the masking comes down. Screen pulls up. Yeah, uh, I guess you could do that. The screen pulls up yeah. and the masking comes down, and that to centers it, it again. Yeah, so but you then don't... you have light just being projected below the screen onto nothingness. It's black light, but it's yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's dark light. light. Yeah. Dark gray, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so anyway, regardless, I'm not a huge fan of that solution. What makes way more sense to me is these days you can get projectors that when they're casting those black bars above and below a 2.35 to 1 aspect image, they're pretty darn black, so I really wouldn't get overly concerned about the masking um, just for that side of the equation, but the other one is, when you're going with an electric roll-down screen, the case that holds it to the ceiling is substantially wider than the screen itself. And if it's a tensioned screen, which you would want, I would always highly recommend that if you're going with a roll-down screen, that it be tensioned, especially when you're getting up to the 120, 125-inch size. Yeah. Uh, you don't want that waving or anything like that, then the bar on the bottom where the tension wires are going to be attached is also wider than the screen. So considering your one of your concerns is that you have limited width to work with in this room to begin with, that's going to end up getting you a substantially smaller actual screen because the case and the bottom bar have to fit in that width. So I don't think electric roll down is your friend in this case. You could go with a regular fixed frame acoustically transparent screen and build a false wall have your speakers behind the screen. How big is this guy's room? Did I say that? Is it in I, here? I don't know how long his room is. Yeah. I mean, he was talking about having like a 15-foot distance, though, from eyes to screen. So he's got enough room front to back that if he were to build a false wall and bring that screen closer, he'd actually get a bigger field of view from the same size screen, and he could have all his speakers behind the screen. I... I kind of really like that solution because building a false wall doesn't cost much at all. It's like a few 2 by 4s It's just there to hold the screen in place. There's really nothing to it. And everything so. else is acoustically transparent fabric. 
So Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, if you were willing to go to the expense of having a custom installer put in-ceiling speakers in for you, there's no reason why that same guy shouldn't be able to build you a false wall. Dude, you can get anybody easy. build you a false wall. Too. Exactly. <laughs> that's, not, that's really not... Yeah, so I'm I'm not in favor of the ceiling speakers just like Tom and we, we we talked a lot about imaging last week when it comes to just two channel. Man, try to try to get proper imaging from front in ceiling speakers. I don't care how good their dispersion are, it doesn't work. They're counting on the whole thing where our brain tends to put together image and sound. So if you're watching something on screen and even if the sounds are coming from in ceiling speakers, our brain tends to put that together so that it seems like the sounds are still coming from the screen. But if you're just listening to music with nothing on the screen, you're going to be like, why is all my music coming from up above me? Uh, exactly and that is not going to be happy yeah. times. So. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things we've mentioned would be the way to go. How many times have you walked through a department store, heard the music, and thought, oh, it's coming from that shirt over there? <laughs> exactly <laughs> never. You've always known it was above you. Even yeah. without having to look up and see a speaker up there, you've always known. And yeah. that's just the way it's going to be. So, yeah. yes, when you're watching the... movies, it might be sort of okay. Yeah. But, yeah. No. Yeah. Man. Get an acoustically transparent screen and a false wall, man. That, I think that's your happiest. That's 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 Rob's. If you're looking, if you're looking to keep everything on that back wall there, then I think you can easily get away with what the other suggestions that we made here. So, all right, yeah. here we go. Okay. On to this week's questions. Wow, we're making great time. Half an hour. <laughs> Ian uh, has an 18 foot by 30 foot room with a cathedral ceilings with exposed beams that is 12 feet high at its peak. The room has some light control can be made pretty dark during the day. Ian wants to <laughs> install a projector and screen for 1250 total or less. His front runners are the Epson 8350 with an Elite Screens manual pull-down 120-inch screen, both mounted to the ceiling. Do these seem like good choices? Yes. Yeah. No, yeah. We, that, I'm okay with that. I, I think Epson 8, uh, 8350, we've recommended it a number of times on this podcast. Uh, Elite Screens makes very good screens. I'm very happy with my Elite Screen. I have a pull-up Elite Screen. I think it's fantastic. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm very happy with it. Uh, okay, there we go. That's the first one. Would we recommend something else? Well, I'm sure we could. But <laughs> I'd give you an alternative on the projector for sure. It, what, what's your alternative on the projector? Uh, it would be the BenQ, uh, is it a W1075? Um, that's their $1,000 projector that they're selling. That's DLP. So, I mean, the difference is, is that the BenQ1075, it can do 3D. The Epson 8350 can't. I'm sure you already do that, so 3D is probably not a big deal. Yep. Um, the Epson is quieter. It is for sure quieter. The BenQ is not loud, but it's not exactly silent, although you have a very high ceiling, so that might not be a huge concern. But the 8350 has considerably more lens shift. The BenQ has no horizontal lens shift at all and a small amount of vertical lens shift. And I think it's a 1.2 to 1 zoom, so some zoom, but not very much. The Epson is definitely more flexible in terms of placement with much larger uh, range of vertical lens shift, some horizontal lens shift, and a longer zoom. So, yeah, if you can go through those things, uh, I, yeah, I have absolutely no problem recommending the 8350. It's a great choice. There you go. Uh, so what And what kind of image should you expect as compared to a 60-inch Panasonic plasma? Bigger is what you can <laughs> expect. Oh, yeah. 120 it'll be bigger. 60 to 120, that is a not insubstantial difference. You yeah, and it'll be that. quite bigger. Now, do you think it'll look like a plasma? No, it does not look like a no. plasma. No, it's not going to look and like a plasma. And without complete light control, like saying, oh, I can get a pretty dark during the day, like, you'd be surprised how pretty dark, how bright pretty dark is. Well, honestly, I, you know, I, I had a, in my room in uh, Australia was not at all, dark, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and it was not easy to see stuff in there. I mean, could I could watch. It was really watch, washed out. I could watch stuff in there. It wasn't a lot of fun. I tended not to use a projector uh, during the day uh, mm -hmm. for that reason. Uh, it depends on, you know, I mean, it depends on what you mean by pretty dark, but uh, yeah, in that situation, there's going to be no comparison. The plasma is going to blow away your projector as far as just amount of light that it can output. Now, when you get complete, when it's dark and it's complete light control, uh, the plasma is still going to be a. It's a different. It's a. It's a direct view. It's directly yeah. shooting light into your eyeballs. This is you know, projector is reflected. The thing is, to get a 120 inch plasma, you need <laughs> a car. You know, I mean, you need yep. to sp spend for a Lexus, and 
you're asking to get that same size for twelve fifty. That's like saying, I'll pay for the cup holder, but I want the whole car. How good would that be to, to the to getting the car? Well, it's going to be a lot. I mean, it's going to be bigger. It's going to be a lot bigger for a lot cheaper, and uh, that's what you're getting for it. It's going to be good. It's going to look good. It's going to look, you know, it's going to look very high def. It's going to it's going to have all that stuff, but it's not going to be as bright. It's not going to have that pop that yeah. plasmas do, and that's just that's just the cold hard facts of it, man. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, during the day, it actually might not be as big of a difference as we're even describing because. Panasonic plasmas, during the day, if there was some light in the room, they didn't retain their black levels super duper well. They, they, got, a, they got a little bit washed out, a little bit gray. Um, they weren't known for being super duper bright. I mean, certainly not like, you know, LCD TV oh, sure. bright. Yeah. So actually, if you were watching a plasma during the day and then you went to this projector at night, like... The projector might actually even look better. So Maybe. I, I, I don't really think you'll be disappointed. I mean, that's ultimately no. what he's really worried about is will he yeah. be super disappointed going from a plasma to this? And I don't think so. I mean, no. the size alone is going to be super impressive. Um, I was going to mention as far as screens go, sometimes when you don't have perfect light control, I like to recommend uh, either a higher gain or a retro-reflective screen like the daylight high power. But he said he's mounting this projector to his ceiling. So that means it's going to be shooting down at an angle and then bouncing off and coming back, you know, down to his eyes. So a retroreflective screen isn't going to work. Retroreflective means it sh it reflects the light back to where it came from. You don't need the light being reflected back up to your ceiling. So that wouldn't help you. Yeah, and I, who knows? Don't judge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> high gain, I mean, like Tom was saying, once you get past about 1.2 or 1.3, you start getting into hot spotting and stuff like that. So I think your plan is good. I would say go with that plan. I think you got a good plan. Good job, Ian. Uh, yeah. He also wants to protect his uh, his new projector with a battery backup UPS, which is a great idea. Mm -hmm. to, to reiterate to the listeners at home, you want anything that has a bulb in it that has to cool down, you want to have a UPS, a battery backup UPS. What that does is it gives if the power goes out when you're in the middle of watching something you watch a you know a six six of the eight hours of extended versions of Lord of the Rings, and the power goes out. Well, your bulb has just been cooking for six hours. Now it needs that fan to cool it down, or you're gonna you risk it exploding. Really, you you risk the bulb exploding, but at the very least you risk uh, it. Short, seriously shortening the lifespan from whatever the three, four thousand hours it's rated at to something closer to a thousand or maybe five hundred. You know, you can really, really hurt your bulb that way. So you need your battery backup to allow your projector bulb, and this is in rear projection, front projection, anything with a bulb. Uh, I wonder if that's true of uh, tube amplifiers too. I guess I don't know that. <laughs> uh, those tube guys probably don't plug them into battery backups yeah. because that would, you know. I certainly up. recommend right. battery backup for anything with a hard drive as well, because yeah. anything that's got a spinning hard drive that needs to save stuff sure is nice to not have the power just cut out suddenly while yeah. it's doing that. So, so he yeah. gave us three options. He gave us the APC BE fifty five. Uh, was it five hundred fifty five five zero? I think that's like a, a a computer one, right? Yeah, more or less. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it looks like a it looks like a really big fat power strip. <laughs> yeah, it's what it looks like. And he gave us a, a midline one, which was uh, the J25B or a more expensive J15. Now, th this is, Ian, this is sort of my thing. Anything that comes from a reputable brand, and by, and by reputable, I don't mean the audiophiles like it. I mean a reputable, like they really do know what they're doing brand. Furman, Pana, uh, Panamax, is it Panamax? Panamax, right? Uh, APC, any of those brands... Uh, are good. I'm sure there's other ones out there that are just not coming to my mind right now. Uh, any of those, if they're making the battery backup, I trust them. That's fine. You can choose any one that's in your price point. That's fine. But we have found, Clint and I, when we've done installs, have found that if you hook up a computer design battery backup to a projector, sometimes you run into issues. Okay, and the issues will be, it just the it won't the projector will go. Nope, I'm not turning on. That's a pretty serious issue, all right. But uh, it, it's not like it blows it up. It's like it just it just doesn't work for some reason. Now, Clint never could really figure out why that was, but he had it happen on more than one occasion, and I've seen it happen on occasion too. So what I always say is, as long as you're getting one that's designed for home theater, that's which that's all you need. 
Now, are you looking for something that's that's going to power not just your projector so that it can cool down, but also maybe you know you can keep watching your movie for an hour or two, or maybe you'll plug your refrigerator into it as well. Uh, you know, <laughs> these are that. you know plug I would, your refrigerator. would not recommend doing that. But you know what I'm saying? I mean, if you're looking for it to, to power for a longer period of time, well, then you might want to go for one of the more expensive units. But if you're only really trying to make sure that your your projector can cool down. Then you can get the lowest price one that has battery backup that's from a reputable dealer. And APC, that mid price J, J25B would probably be perfect. Yeah, I would. Uh, I can easily recommend the J25. Um, I mean, it, it certainly is more expensive than that 550 unit, but I agree with everything Tom just said. Um, you know, that one has six outlets that are battery backup and then two additional outlets that are surge protection only that they recommend you plug in really high power devices like, say, your uh, amplifier, right, or your subwoofer. You might want to plug those into the surge only, and it's not a huge deal if those go silent when the power goes out um, as long as they're, you know, protected from surges and lightning strikes and things like that. So, you know, six outlets, yeah, you're probably, maybe you won't be able to plug absolutely everything you have into uh, only six outlets, but you can certainly plug in all the important things like your DVR and your projector and anything else that needs active cooling or has something spinning and needs to be able to save things. So, yeah, yeah the J25, in my opinion, worth it, and it will definitely get the job done. Yeah. Really nice unit. All right. So, Jared, uh, he bought the uh, AVRX, the Denon AVRX 4000. Yay! After we said, sure, go for it last week. Yay! <laughs> Validation for your purchase. His old AV receiver actually uh, had Odyssey 2EQ. That's like the most basic Odyssey that's had been around for a ever. And it didn't even have multi Q. So he listened to our podcast with Chris Kiriakakis. <laughs> I Did I get it? it? There, that was pretty darn close. Dude, I shut your mouth. I, you I know what? That was, I, that was I right. That was I, I, you should change his name. Position the microphone as Chris described, and while the difference is, is not vast, it is definitely <laughs> noticeable. So Odyssey 2 EQ to uh, Multi-Q XT32 with sub EQ, EQ HD, HD, whatever it is. <laughs> it's a lot of, that's a lot of stuff. Mm. Uh it was not a vast difference, but it was definitely noticeable, especially in the lower frequencies, where it seems to have smoothed things out considerably compared to his old system. Now, he upgraded to the Epson 8350. Ian, mm -hmm. he upgraded to the Epson 8350, and he loves it. He highly recommends it and thinks the lens shift and its contrast are both excellent features at its price point. So there you go, Ian. More validation. <laughs> he also upgraded from his 106-inch pull-down Grey Wolf screen, which he had thought was 120 inches this whole time. <laughs> there's a joke in here about how... Uh, I'm not going to even say it. There's, just, there's a joke in here. <laughs> Let your imagination run wild. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, now, I'm now, now I'm totally distracted. Uh, to a fixed-frame Elite Screens model that actually is 120 inches. So he went from 106, which he thought was 120 inches, to 120 inches. Uh, and he loves the larger field of view. Still trying not to make this joke. All right. <laughs> I will mention uh, that Gray Wolf screen. That is one of those less expensive uh, screens that has... It's gray in color, hence the name. And has a coding on it so that it has a higher than one gain. That's one of those ones that tries to give you the whole package of lowering your black levels but not lowering your white levels. And, um, I mean, I'm not sure whether Jared would totally agree with me on this. Uh, I mean, he did ultimately end up going to a white screen, the Elite Screen's white screen, and he's saying he really loves it. Now, he didn't say anything explicitly about not liking the way the Grey Wolf looked, um, but that's one of those ones where it's like, man, those Grey screens, they just... They, they never quite look right to me. So. Well, you know, <laughs> Jared can confirm whether whether he agrees with yeah, that. Yeah, Jared, you don't have to give us a call back on that one. But uh, there, there's something to be said about having something that people walk in and go, "What?" You know, <laughs> you know what I mean. There's something to be said for that, and I I value that. I want uh, I, I I value people coming into my home theater and going, "What is that water cooler thing looking over there?" Oh, that's a <laughs> sub one for Bubby. That's his brother. Um, yeah, so I value that. So maybe Jared liked it on that level at the very least. Uh, but anyways, uh, he, now, to, to go on, he loves all that stuff. Blah, blah, blah. He also painted the front wall uh, flat black and its side walls dark gray with a bit of a blue tint. Uh, he, he, let me see, he installed absorption panels with a 4-inch gap behind them, and he shared some photos of his theater, and it looks amazing. Well, wow, this is, the, we haven't even gotten to a freaking question yet. Jeez. 
So well, anyways, that was all to, to lead up so that you know what you're looking at when you see the photos that will pay. Yes, it's a very nice theater, and these are the these are the pictures really that nice. whoever I said should look at. You should look at these with. We, yes. All right. Jared has two rows of seats. As a stopgap, he has a second row elevated by stacks of encyclopedias. That scares me a little bit. Does he actually have the encyclopedias underneath the chair legs? I mean, if they're hard covers. <laughs> I'm glad that somebody has to use for encyclopedias these days. Yeah. You know what I mean? Honestly. I wouldn't want to use like phone books because those seem a little slidey to me. Yeah. But I mean, if these are like hardcover encyclopedias, sure, why not? Build a platform out of them. I think that's sketchy, and I'm not sitting on that thing. <laughs> All right. Anyways, he wants to build a, a riser for this, and he's heard of some people making a riser that also doubles as a large base trap. He's thinking of making a riser that is open on all four sides and then covering it with fabric similar to the way uh, he made the absorption panels and having the underside of the riser stuff with insulation. Will this work? Uh, well, uh, kind of. Okay, so yeah. this is your, this is what you, Jared, this is what you're worried about. Okay, and the rest of his questions is like, you know, whatever, all kind of veering off into this. So this is what you're worried about. You're worried about the thing resonating. Okay, you're worried about that thing vibrating. That's what you're worried about. So there's two, you can do one of two things. You can either stop it from vibrating or you can use that vibration as a, uh, as a resonator, as a resonant panel, a resonant trap. So what you have to do for that, and this is not something I recommend you try, what you do for that is that you tune that riser, and you do that by building it to specific specifications with a, you know, I mean, it's very specific. And then, the, you know, the wood has to be a, a specific thickness and then density and then, the, you know, how much the air gap is. And then you, cut, you basically drill holes all throughout it so that you know air is going in and out of it. You put absorption on the inside usually, some a manner of absorption on the inside, and then it resonates at a, super, su a certain frequency. And whatever that frequency is, is the frequency that you're having problems with in your room. Okay, so then you have to first you have to identify where, where you, what resonant frequency you have for that problem with your room. Then mm -hmm. you have to build this trap so that it vibrates there. And then you have to do that while at the same time factoring in that you're putting a couch on top of it. Yep. And then on top of that, your couch is now going to vibrate at that resonant frequency, whatever that is. <laughs> and I find that extremely annoying. Uh, mm. I do find that annoying. So there's nothing wrong with with keeping it open and f stuffing it full of, of insulation. I think that's a fine idea. There's nothing wrong with that. Wrapping it in fabric or putting carpet on top and then wrapping the sides in fabric or something, that's a mm -hmm. fine idea for a little bit extra base trapping. But I really think you need to take whatever big flat piece of plywood that you're putting on top and you need to dampen them, damp them down so that they're not resonating as yeah. much as you can. Yeah, the, the bigger worry here, I, I would first of all say, okay, could I make this thing a base trap? Yes, there are ways to do that, but I would be much more worried about making it inert. That that would be my higher priority, is not having that riser be a big vibration platform. So, yeah, the things that Tom said, I mean, um, I, I would do a double layer of whatever material you're using as the actual platform that the chairs are going to be sitting on, probably going to be plywood. Uh, I would recommend having a double layer of that with something like green glue in between it, which is a, a constrained layer damping material that uh, even if the upper layer is vibrating or the lower layer is vibrating, well, one doesn't transfer its energy to the other. So that's all about damping that top layer to stop uh, vibrations, making the, uh, the platform itself more inert. As for stuffing all the underside of it and everything with installation, I mean, it, being a riser, it's probably going to be eight inches high, maybe even higher, but usually a standard riser is eight inches high. Um, so, I mean, that's essentially the same as having, you know, like an eight inch thick uh, base trap on some, some part of your room, or uh, you could also have the insulation towards the top and still have an air gap. So, you know, same idea, four inches of insulation, four inches of air. But you do have to realize that you've got a solid layer, which is the platform on the top, and then another solid layer, which is the floor below it. So the sound waves are only bouncing back and forth in that eight inch gap, which is not bass frequencies. Eight bass frequencies are longer than that. So you're only absorbing as the sound waves go through it, like from side to side or from front to back, where the actual size is large enough that it's long enough to 
capture the sound waves. So even there, it's certainly not a terrible idea to have, say, the two sides open so that, you know, sound uh, air can move underneath and get trapped by that insulation under there. That's fine. But the bigger concern is making it inert, damping it so that it doesn't vibrate. Because going to the whole trouble of trying to turn it into a resonating bass trap, uh, more that's trouble more, than it's worth. That, that's man. more math than I'm willing <laughs> to do, that's, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's, so, that's, that's a lot, that's of, math, a lot of drilling because you have to have like specific size holes and they have to be in a specific, you know, a specific number of them. I looked mm -hmm. into it because I had in my room in Jacksonville, I had a problem at like 60 hertz or something. And I was like, well, I'll just build a resonant bass trap. And I looked into it and went, oh my God, this could take me forever. <laughs> and even then, I might do it wrong, and then I'm going to be completely hosed. Well, because you attach it, usually you attach something like that to a wall, someplace like in the corner, and it does its little vibrating thing, and it's not, yeah. it sounds awful. Anyways, uh, let me see what else. Are there any other considerations you should take into account? We would trust that. And will placing a subwoofer between the riser and the wall be any sort of problem for the subwoofer? No. Okay. Nope. There we go. <laughs> I mean, I don't really think that. I mean, no. That, I don't think that really needs any explanation, but yeah. no is the answer. So there you go. Monty. Monty just wants a 32-inch TV for about $200 for a secondary room. His 27-inch CRT needs to go. <laughs> yeah, it does. Uh, but he's only ever used plasma TVs when it comes to flat panels. Since this would be an LCD, what do we recommend? And if he cares about picture quality, what features should he consider? Is 120 hertz worthwhile at this size and price point? First of all, 120 hertz. Crap. I uh, don't really... Uh, 120 hertz is something that you're going to turn on and go, ah, it looks weird, and you're going to turn it back off again. That's like how, how that generally works in my experience. Now, you might not think that, or you might have some other experience, or you might get, like, the one TV that does it right. But, uh, yeah, everything about that hertz thing is LCD trying to overcome the limitation of the fact that it doesn't turn on, it doesn't flash at you like a plasma does or a DLP does. Okay, it doesn't flash at you like a CRT does. That image comes at you and it just flashes for a second, right? And your brain's like, okay, that was a weird little picture thing I just saw, and it sees another one. It's like, okay, those two must be connected and connects them. Okay, LCD stay on, and then they turn off and they come on again, and they turn off and they come on again, and that fading in and out, that's where this motion blur comes from. We're seeing too much of each one of those images. We're seeing it's not it's not quite enough. So the idea between the 120 hertz, I always thought was that, you know, we would put uh, we, you would say uh, you would, everything would be playing at 60 hertz like normal, except that in between each one there would be a black. Some TVs what? do have that. They call black frame insertion. But they still are having. It's still not turning on and off fast enough. So yeah. it really doesn't make that much of a difference. So in the end. Don't worry about that. Honestly, Monty, now Rob's going to give you a specific suggestion because when you ask Rob a question, he has to give you an answer. I read this and went, <laughs> I would tell Monty what I'm going to do. If it sure. were me, this is what I would do. I would go to Sam's or Best Buy or wherever I go to shop for these sorts of things, and I would go and find their discount sales rack thing. I would go back there, and I would look to see what they had. I mean, I'm looking for the, the, the open box specials. I'm looking for whatever because you're just one of the 32-inch TV and you're looking for as cheap as possible, and you want to get the best possible deal. Open box, baby. You go back there, and you look to see what they got, you pull out your phone, and you go to CNET or whoever, you know, whoever you trust, and you look up the review, and you go, oh, yeah, it's got, it's, you know, oh, well, you know, the remote's kind of crap, but uh, the image quality is very good. You know, the contrast is excellent. Oh, this is mine. I'll take that for $120. <laughs> You know, that's exactly what I would do. That's exactly what I would do. I would, yep. I, I wouldn't worry about shopping for one specifically. I would go to where things are on sale, like real sales, and go, oh, what do you got? This is what you got. These are the best ones. I'll take that one. If you don't find it, well, you'll come back in a week. <laughs> Honestly, that's so, what I would do. My way of coming at this was, I mean, first of all, there's going to be a pile of sales, obviously, the time of year that we're in right now. So it's kind of hard to say go out right now when it might still be at regular retail price and could easily be on sale in a couple of weeks. Um, but I headed over to the wire cutter, headed over to CNET, look at their lists of what they're recommending. And in this size, both of them are highly recommending the Vizio E320. I think it's the B2-B2. Uh, so that's the current model. What 
everybody likes about this is the thing that I would consider, because he says he does care about picture quality, and he's used to looking at plasmas, and the thing that bugs me most about LCDs is when they have an uneven backlight. And that is a really common thing, especially when you're looking at inexpensive TVs and small and ones, because a lot lit. of times, yeah. yeah, a lot of times the edge-lit ones, when they're this small, they only have lights on one edge, like only on the top or only on the <laughs> bottom. Um, or if they're, you know... Uh, CCFL, the uh, fluorescent light in the background, oftentimes it's just, it, it's all blotchy or cloudy. It just doesn't look right. So my biggest concern is the backlight. This particular Vizio, the E320, is a full array LED backlight. That means the TV itself is a little thicker than you might have imagined. It's kind of like two inches thick. Um, but I mean, if you're looking at the TV from the side and that just really bothers you, I, I've never had a problem with a two inch thick TV myself. Um, so, yeah, that's what I like about it. That's what all the reviewers like about it. Good black levels, good contrast, good colors, which is rare at this uh, price point as well, actually having accurate colors. So I would certainly look at that. Right now it's going for like $230. I can almost guarantee that thing will be on sale within the next couple of weeks. Yeah. So yeah. I, I would it, keep an eye out yeah. for that one. Anyway. Yeah. And that one is on, only 60 hertz, and nobody's complained about its motion blur or anything looking any worse than the ones that claim to be 120. So that is not something to worry about. Yeah, I, 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 the last thing I would be looking at is that 120 hertz thing. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Rohan uh, wants to know, if we were setting up Atmos in our theaters, would we opt for in-ceiling speakers, Dolby Atmos-enabled elevation speakers, those upward-firing ones, or mm -hmm. would we repurpose some regular speakers? Uh, I, I think, honestly, you can't really repurpose regular speakers. I mean, you can, but uh, I don't know that... that if I were going to try to set it up in my home theater, mm -hmm. yeah, I would just take some bookshelves and stick shelves and stick them on top of what I got if I if I could, uh, just to test it out. But if I were really interested in it, I would go with in-ceiling speakers or ceiling-mounted speakers or however we yeah. just term yeah, it. If I had the wonderful luxury that I wish for of building a custom theater from the ground up in the basement or something like that, I would definitely be going for... I would. I don't like in anything. I don't like in walls. I don't like in ceilings. Not that there There's aren't some good There's ones There's a joke in that statement right there. I'm going to let that yeah, one sure, go, yeah. too. <laughs> not, not, not saying there aren't some good in-wall speakers and some good in-ceiling speakers available out there, but I just don't like... Oh, here we go. But I don't like drilling holes in the walls because that affects the soundproofing as well and trying to overcome all that by having big 8-inch diameter holes drilled all over the place. So... I would, if I was doing it from scratch, I'd be going for on-ceiling speakers, but in where I am right now, since I'm not moving at least for about a year, uh, and probably longer than that, uh, I'd be repurposing what I got. I'd just be going for front heights and rear heights, because actually, I mean, the more I hear about Oro, uh, the more I'm willing to maybe give that a try. So if I had front heights and rear heights, that actually kind of works as a good compromise for both Atmos and Oro. So. I would definitely go for heights before I went for ceiling speakers, yeah. but he didn't ask that question. I answered the question as asked. Well, I'm, I'm giving my full consideration. Whatever. So. Yes. I asked answered the question. All right. A month. Which has got to be the most interesting. I think the we... emphasis on the first syllable. I'm just Hot going month. by where he put the put the capital letter. Well, the... I don't know. I don't know about that. A month has three rooms. A theater, a family room, and an office. All of the AV gear for all three rooms is together in one closet, which, by the way, must be a very warm closet. Right <laughs> now, each room basically has its own separate equipment. Three AV receivers, separate sources for each room. He would like to have a setup where any room could view any source or all the rooms could be viewing the same source simultaneously. His top priority is for this to be possible in the family room and the office. Also, doing this in the theater isn't necessary, although it would be nice. What new equipment does he need in order to make this happen? Now, a month. If I were, uh, if you we were going from scratch, you'd be. Uh, I'd be probably talking about like really high-end receivers with you know two, three, four <laughs> zones, you know, and we'd be worrying about all that stuff. Um, since you've already got all this stuff, anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, what you can do is pick a, pick the sources you want to keep. I imagine if there's cable boxes involved, you're going to want to keep all three cable boxes. But if it's DVDs, if it's a DVD uh, player, like you could probably just keep the one DVD player, the one PlayStation, or whatever it is. Um, and I guess you're going to have to go with some sort of uh, uh, switch and put it between your sources and your all, I guess, all of your AV receivers. Yeah, there's a couple of ways to come at this. I mean, I... I would rather go whole hog on this because it's fairly easy to do, which is 
any source in any room. Uh, and if you want to show one source in multiple rooms simultaneously, being able to do that too. And you can do that fairly easily by using matrix switchers. I mean, I'm, I am making the assumption here that he's using HDMI sources. Um, certainly all of his AV receivers that he's using right now uh, have HDMI switching, so that isn't the problem. Um, if you just go over to Monoprice, they sell four by four HDMI switchers, which means you can have four HDMI sources plugged in, and then you can connect that to as many as four different displays, or in his case, it'll be three different AV receivers. Uh, and then any of those receivers can watch any of those sources, including having one source feeding multiple receivers. So the matrix switchers make sense to me. If he's got more than four sources, there's no reason why he can't just have two four by four matrix switchers, because he's certainly got more than two HDMI inputs on each of his AV receivers. So that, I mean, that might not be the absolute cheapest way to go at it, but it certainly gives you the most flexibility. It would yeah. let you watch any source in any room. And the ones at Monoprice aren't, like, exorbitantly expensive. No. So uh, I would just kind of go with that. Now, if you want the absolute bare minimum and you're saying, all I really need is family room and office and not going to worry about the theater, then all you really need to do is any sources that you want to be able to watch in both of those rooms, you just put a splitter on them. You put a one in to out HDMI splitter on those sources and then there it is. It's fine feeding either one or the other. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's really all you need. But I'd go for the Matrix one, man. It's so much nicer. Yeah, it depends on what he wants. It's a weird problem. Uh, ob you know, obviously, it's a really weird problem. So uh, it's cool. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you asked. So yeah, the, you can kind of, depends on how much money you want to spend and how mm -hmm. much flexibility you want to have and how many actual sources and pieces of gear you, 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 you want to have to go to the different rooms. So uh, when you get into whole home audio and stuff like that, that's where a custom installer all, starts to make more sense to me. You know, when you, your custom installer is going to come in and they're going to have like all sorts of tools and you know, uh, you know, they're going to be able to program their to control for the Crestron or whatever in order to give you the the kind of fluidity of control that you actually want. Oh, watch this here and do that there, and boom, 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 and everything's just going to kind of work. Whereas the way you're going to have to do this is you're going to have to you know get your harmony or your number of harmonies or however you're going to do it, and it's going to end up being a lot more. Just more. <laughs> it's just going to end up being a lot more. <laughs> it is, yeah, because then you have to say you have to program in. Uh, for each output, um, what source it's selecting. So, I mean, uh, essentially, instead of just switching between HDMI inputs on each AV receiver independently, you're now doing all the switching in the matrix switcher. Yeah. So it's not vastly more complicated, but it would mean a little bit more reprogramming. I just looked it up. The the 4x4 four four, uh, matrix HDMI switcher at mono price is $158. Oof. So, Breaking the I mean, bank. Yeah, I mean, that's expensive, but not ridiculous to do what you want to do. Ridiculous. All right. <laughs> Steve, uh, Steve's full basement is over 9,000 cubic feet. That's large. He has one large. set of doors that he can close to make it closer to 6,500 cubic feet for his home theater. That's close still, those doors. Still large. <laughs> you you but, want to keep yeah. those doors closed. Close, close those doors. Key. Uh, he's currently got a 5.1 Pioneer Andrew Jones set of speakers and the little 8-inch subwoofer isn't cutting it, surprising no one. <laughs> in fact, I'm surprised uh, the, the Andrew Jones speakers are cutting in the room that big, but, you know, I'm sure they're fine, but... I haven't... Well, it's, it's, I mean, yeah, that's not, it's actually like four rooms, but they're all open to each other, and only one of them has doors that he can close. Yeah. So he's, he's kind of, he's in the elbow of an L shape, so he's got a room over to his left and a room behind him. Uh, both of which are wide open to the room that he's using as his theater. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. However, he also wants to get a front projector, and his wife would actually be more accepting of that purchase. He can only afford to get either a new subwoofer or a projector right now, so which should he choose? If he goes for the subwoofer, what should he buy? He should buy the projector, dude. Your wife said, okay. That's what you go <laughs> with. I'm sorry. As much as I love subwoofers. <laughs> Your wife said, okay, the projector, don't buy a subwoofer. Are you insane? Are you nuts? How long have you been married? You haven't been married that long. That's what I think. Maybe that's <laughs> the case. Because I've been married for, four, I don't know, a million years. And if my wife said, uh, yeah, we could do projector, I guess. And I said, well, what about a subwoofer? Uh, I kind of rather a projector. We're getting a projector, all right? <laughs> 
That's all there is to it. That that that's that battle's been won. I ain't going up against that. You can tell her I said so. Go ahead, Rob. Contradict me. I dare you. I I I can't contradict that. I mean, hey, a projector is going to be a very worthwhile and noticeable upgrade to your setup. So it's uh it's not like you're getting nothing there. Um yeah. yeah. At some point, he is going to need to upgrade his subwoofers. Let's go with that. I mean, he wants to. It's just a matter of what he can do right now. So since he was basically asking about subwoofers in his questions, that he wasn't asking specifically for projector suggestions just yet. I guess I you can guess go with the that. Epson A350, though. Everybody else is. <laughs> that? That's the one you should go with. Everyone's doing it, Steve. <laughs> Everyone. Unless you want 3D, then BenQ. And you don't, so go on. <laughs> Ben Q's good anyway, 1075. Um, but yeah, uh, he w he asked what SVS subwoofer should he get, because of course we talk so much about SVS. Um, but this is a case, because I'm looking at his associated equipment and looking at what he, he's saying, you know, budget-wise, and I'm like, I would be pointing you to one of the ultra subs just going by sheer output, yeah. and that is not an inexpensive choice. I mean, the cylinder is the least expensive option, and that's, what, uh, sixteen or $1,700. The big uh, ported box, which is the one you would want if you go with a box style, was $2,000. Those are expensive subs. This is where some of the alternatives like HSU's new uh, VTF-3 Mark V or their VTF-15H uh, uh, high output HO, uh, or Power Sound Audio, their uh, XV15 SE. All of those are in the $800 to $900 range. And as far as getting a lot of output for as little money as possible, boom, there's your solution. That, those are your uh, solutions for sure. Power Sound is, you know, is uh, it's good. doesn't Rhythmic have a solution in this? In this? Well, I mean, like their FV15 uh, or their 15H, which is like their eight. Six or eight hundred watt model. Uh, I mean, that can play even louder than the ultra, but that's like still a fifteen hundred dollar subwoofer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sure. just just in terms of sheer bang for your buck, maximum output for fewest dollars spent, um, it's going to be one of those HSUs with a power sound audio. Like I say, the eight hundred to nine hundred dollar price range can't beat it on value for that. So even though we obviously love SVS, uh, yeah, I think. Uh, you know, some some folks will be happy. Ahmed will be happy that we're not recommending them this time. To, just yeah. to, just to give a different alternative. <laughs> yeah, and this is what happens when you have these big rooms. You know, you're you're suddenly starting to. How often do we talk about output on this? We rarely do because most of the time people have you know reasonable sized room. You have a reasonably large room, sir, and I applaud you for that. And I'm a little bit jealous. And you get to buy subwoofers bigger than some cars, and uh, that's just the way that it's going to go for you. And that's cool. But you're not doing it right now because you're buying a projector because that's what your wife wants. All right. <laughs> but when you do one, when you do put uh, your, your Christmas list together or your, your birthday list or your anniversary list or whatever, uh, we will uh, uh, give you lots of recommendations, and those are some of them. So come back then after you get your new projector, which will be the Epson 8350. Now... <laughs> Dennis asks about uh, he needs a, he needs a, a replacement lamp for his Epson eighty three fifty, but he doesn't want to pay Epson's three hundred dollars asking price if he doesn't have to. He's seen replacement lamps selling for under forty dollars on Amazon. Are they too good to to be true? Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, uh, okay. So usually I pay zero mind to Amazon user reviews <laughs> if I'm reading through looking for something very specific to be mentioned uh, that might answer a question I have about it or something like that. Um, when Amazon user reviews are pointing out, yeah, this projector lamp for $40 failed after 200 hours, I got it and it was much dimmer than the original bulb, I got it and the colors were thrown way off, uh, it started making a uh, screeching, hissing sound at me, these type of things, when these are mentioned in the user reviews, I go, I'm not super shocked given the $40 price tag. So... Um, some people are saying this is great. It's working fantastic for me. It lasted a thousand hours, and even though it, you know, the original one is supposed to last four thousand hours, hey, I can buy four of these for much less than one of the originals. Um, but I wouldn't totally do that. So Tom, you contacted Ray, and we got ourselves an answer. I did. I'm trying to actually look up the price. So keep talking for a second. Uh, 
Okay, yeah. So Ray did get back to us. Thank you very much, Ray. Uh, he hopped online and answered our question. He goes to a place called Projector Lamp Genie. So that's just uh, projectorlampgenie.com. And they have, I mean, they're basically saying these are official lamps. Uh, one of the other things to mention when you're going for one of these third-party lamps that isn't being sold directly by the manufacturer is the manufacturer will say, you know what, if that lamp blows up, we ain't over in your projector because you weren't using our lamp. So it's worthwhile to get a fully authorized one. Uh, so, Tom, have you found the price? Yep, uh, it's $175.95. There you go. So not quite half the price, but definitely a discount off the... There's another one for 60 bucks. I don't know price. how much that one is. <laughs> what the deal is with that? There's two. There's there's three of them. There's the original lamp, which is three fifteen sixty. The diamond lamp. I don't know what that means. Uh, it's one hundred and seventy five ninety five. And the genie lamp, which I might actually have a genie in it for sixty dollars and fifty four cents. Now hmm. I don't know what's the. Oh, there's more of them here too. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the same ones. So uh, this is what I did when I was looking for a lamp. That's where Ray suggests, and Ray does this sort of stuff all the time. So I trust him. Uh, that 175 probably, is whatever I said that was, is probably a good price. I don't know about that 60. I would do some research on that. Um, what I did was, uh, when I replaced my lamp in my Epson, is I went ended up on like, say eBay, like Hong Kong or something, and I eBayed a lamp for like a hundred bucks, and I just it was I just bought it outright. I did research on it first, and it didn't have the casing, didn't have the case and all that stuff. A lot of times the lamp, you know, because the whole thing comes out, and you just take the whole thing out, and then you put the new one in, and you're good. With this one, I had to like take the lamp out. I had to just take the oh. glass out, and I had to like vacuum yeah. out by the little lamp pieces because it had exploded, and then put in the new lamp. And I, I'm comfortable doing that. I used to, you know, do lighting in uh, when I was in drama way back in a million years ago. So I know not to touch it with my bare hands. I know to wear gloves. I know, you know, to be, you know, certain things. Uh, so you, if you're going to do that, be careful and know what you're doing. But uh, that's what I ended up doing. I think I got my lamp for about a hundred bucks when I did it that way. Uh, but uh, do your research. The lamp uh, projector lamp genie is uh, one that Ray highly recommends and. Uh, I think I I checked that out. I don't believe a forty dollar lamp is a good idea. I'm sorry. I just, that yeah. is definitely that doesn't definitely. I'd I'd avoid it for the for Visual the Apex. Epson will say if that breaks. We won't there's a website it. that I trust, Visual Apex. They sell mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. I don't know if they sell replacement lamps or not, but if you've got if you're looking for projectors and TVs and stuff, a lot of times I suggest people go there. So that's a good that's a good website, Visual Apex as well. I, I went there kind of looking at it. I didn't look to see if they had replacement lamps for you or not, though. So you might want to check them out. All right. Anything else on that? Uh, nope. I think we answered that one. All right. Galen. Uh, Galen is very impressed with the Odyssey Multi-Q XT32, blah, 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 sub-EQ, HT, 10.4 hut uh, on the AVR X4000. Okay, yay! All right, so I, I can't wait to use it myself. During one of our hangout parties, Ray, Cor uh, Ray, the same Ray we we're just sp speaking of, mentioned that you can do all of the setup on the Denon using a web browser and simply typing uh, uh, by and by simply typing in the Denon's AVR uh, IP address. Ray also said you can then save your settings so that you can reload them again later if you do it this way. He was wondering how to go about saving his settings. I went to the website, uh, actually, I went to the manual, I looked up the manual, of course, the manuals are notoriously awful, <laughs> and uh, this has this not seemed to change in the last 10 years since I've looked at them. This, this I had to end up doing a search, I don't know how I would have found this otherwise, but yeah, it, literally it looks like just going, once you sign in, there's going to be a save option and a load option, and that's all you have to do is hit save and then hit load and that's pretty much all there is to it from the IP so once you sign into your, you're gonna see it dude so once you sign into it uh, via the website you're gonna be able to the IP address then you're gonna be able to hit the save and load. Do you know exactly where it is? Yeah, I'm, I looked at this, um, now I, I was looking at some of the newer ones uh, specifically I was looking at the new uh, X5200 uh, W so I'm not 100% certain that it's the exact same interface that'll show up on your computer screen with the X4000. I, I don't imagine it's going to be worlds different. Um, 
But yeah, first of all, to get the IP address, I mean, that's easy enough. You either just go into the menus, the setup menu of the Denon, you go down to the network section, and then you look at information, and that right there has the IP address for the receiver itself. Or you can just log into your router and see what devices are connected and figure it out that way. Uh, once you have that IP address, you're literally just typing in those numbers into a web browser. That'll be most likely 192.168.something.something. Uh, and when you, as soon as you hit enter after typing that into your web browser, up will come the setup that can be done right on your web browser there. It's very cool. Um, specifically like in the uh, X5200, uh, there's a discrepancy in that one between what the manual says and what actually shows up during the guided setup when you first turn on that unit, because in the manual it says, oh, you can select to have your front speakers and your front wide speakers as the ones that use pre-outs. And then when you actually go through it, it says, oh no, you can choose height one and height two or front and height two, but nothing to do with front wides. Well, you can set it to front wides inside the web browser. So stuff like that. Uh, sometimes there are settings in the web browser that are easier to get to than in the regular setup menu. So this is a lovely way to set up your AV receiver is doing it through the web browser. It, when you're adjusting all your levels and distances and stuff like that, it's just sliders. Man, is that easier than, you know, click, 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 click on your remote control. So I very much like that. And yes, when you get to the home screen, so once you delve down into all the little menus, you have to go back and back and back and back until you get back to the home screen. But once you do, bottom left corner, there are your options for save and load. And if you click on save, it'll give you a little warning that the receiver is going to basically bundle up all of its settings and create a file. And so they're saying that that takes 10 to 15 minutes for it to do that. But it yeah, bundles up all the settings. Take that long. <laughs> it yeah. probably doesn't, but they, they warn you that it might. Um, it bundles it all up. It gives you a little file, and that file is then available to just save on your computer as a file, and then if you want to reload those settings, then you can do so uh, by clicking the load button and navigating to wherever you save that file. So it's a cool way to do it. It's, uh, it's a way to make sure that you don't lose all those settings that might have taken you a while to plug in, especially if you did things like renamed all your inputs. Man, is that annoying. Like if you ever have to do a factory reset on your AV receiver for some reason, or sometimes even just doing a firmware update, it ends up wiping out things like you know, if you renamed all your inputs, it's sure nice to have that all backed up on your computer. Yeah, that's nice, especially if you have kids and they press buttons or sit on remotes. All so right. It's another fun thing you can do with Denon's and Marantz's. Marantz's yeah. do it too because they're the same company. Well, Yamaha's been doing IP stuff for a long time too. I don't know mm -hmm. how much, you know, how much uh, control you have if you can download the, or whatever, but I know they've been doing it as well. There's no reason to think they're not still doing that, especially with their, you know, higher end. <laughs> Stuff. Now, Galen has as many as 14 speakers in seven different rooms and outdoors. He'd like to know what we recommend to power them all, even though he managed to run all of them just off the uh, Zone 2 amplifiers of his Onkyo TX SR805 previously. Man, that receiver must have gotten hot. Now, <laughs> I, I, I've been thinking about this since we, this, since we started this podcast, and I'm wondering if he has these all wired in series. I, I don't know. He was mentioning that he had some, like, volume knob thingies in each room that supposedly, if you follow the instructions of how to install them, were supposed to balance the... The, the impedance? Input. Yeah. So I'm wondering if it... I mean, it should be some combination of series and parallel connections. So why can't he run these off of his Denon? Because it doesn't have a... Well, this was one of the things we talked about this in the Hangout, and this is one of the, th the about the only thing he actually regrets about having switched over to the Denon from uh, the uh, from the Onkyo that he had before. It has seven amplifiers. Galen has a 7.1 setup in his theater, uh, but what he was doing previously was that on the fly he could on his Onkyo reassign his surround back channels to be his zone two. Now, the Denon that he has now, the X4000, it can also use the surround back amplifiers to power zone 2, but it cannot switch between being zone 2 and surround back on the fly. You have to actually go into the speaker setup menu and tell it either I have 7.1 or I have 5.1 with a powered zone 2. And you can't just easily toggle back and forth between them. So that's the issue that he's having is that uh, uh, I see. If, if he uses the Denon to actually power zone 2, it's not a simple thing to get back to being 7.1 in his theater when he wants to do that. All right. Uh, well, if you were able to power these previously off the amps that are your, 
in your uh, Onkyo. There's no reason why you shouldn't just be able to buy any old two power, a two channel amplifier, preferably one from like somebody like Emotiva that we you know is gonna not flip out if it gets into some weird opinions <laughs> and stuff and do it that way. Now, it, I really don't think that it's any it's any more complicated than that. I think he just needs any old two channel amplifier that's that that's uh, robust, I'll say, or at least as robust as the the ones that were in his Ankyo. Now, if you are actually going to power 14 speakers in seven, t seven different rooms, and they were, all the wires were coming back to one place, which I don't think is what's going on here, then you would want something called a distribution amplifier. Okay? And a distribution amplifier allows you to plug in multiple speakers into one amp and then allocate where things go based on, you know, you can actually switch it. You can switch it in and out. And it depends on which amplifier you have and which uh, you know it, it, there might be like a row of inputs and then a bunch of speaker connections and then you can you can have the distribution amplifier uh, select it or it just might be just like a multi-channel amplifier and you put the inputs here you know three or four inputs and there's a switch in the back and it says okay this is going to go for this this pair of speakers or this speaker is going to from the uh, to, it's feeding from in, input one. This one's input one. This one's input one. This one's input one. These two, these two are input two. That sort of thing. So you would do it that way. You would look for something called a distribution amplifier that had the right number of channels with the right number of inputs for exactly what you wanted to do. But I don't think that's what Galen needs. I think he just needs a two-channel amplifier from you, Matthew. Yeah, I mean, the, obviously the um, the drawback of just using a two-channel amplifier is that all of those 14 speakers will only ever be playing the exact same thing. That's what he had I mean, before, so he, he before. said that that was a problem, right? That's right, yeah. So, um, you know, he, he had been talking to uh, the fellows over at Accessories for Less. They recommended a uh, amplifier from Sherborn. Now, Sherborn is basically built by Emotiva anyway, so you can sort of figure out what kind of quality it is, which is great quality. Um, but it is an interesting one because it is a two-channel amplifier, but it has four pairs of outputs and then four selector switches on the front so that you can say, I want the first pair on, I want the second pair on, third pair on, fourth pair on independently. And then depending on what switches you've clicked, it does all the series parallel connections internally to make sure that those two amplifier channels are balanced properly and don't get into a situation where they're trying to drive one ohm or something crazy like that. That. So, I mean, that's a it's an interesting solution. Um, there's no reason he can't still connect. Uh, what would it be? I guess three pairs of speakers to each of those four outputs <laughs> to try and get up to at least twelve speakers. Yeah, I don't know, dude. It's a lot of speakers you're powering. I think he's but... already got them wired in series, anyways, and yeah, you know, I think he just use a two-channel amplifier. I think that that solution that they gave you was too complex. Unless I don't understand what you're talking about, unless I'm not reading right into this, in which case you need to send us some more information. But if you've got all 14 speaker wires in there and you're like wiring them together into one ginormous like <laughs> six gauge wire, well then, okay, we need, to, we need to talk about this a little bit. But I honestly think that that's not what's going on. I think you have it wired all in series with these little switches, little volume knob thingies that are, mm -hmm. are balancing the impedance and everything and that's fine. Then just get a two-channel amp. Unless you want to start separating out the different sources at different places, yeah. in which case then we can do that too. Yeah. So now you can even start getting into wireless stuff with like Sonos, because Sonos does have their um, system, which is basically it's a wireless connection, of course, being Sonos, and then it basically is just a little two-channel amplifier, uh, so you can connect whatever speakers you already have to their little two-channel amplifier, and then it connects it all wirelessly into the Sonos system. And then you can say, this music in this room, this different music in this other room, and you can do all kinds of fun stuff with that. But then it's Sonos, and it's expensive, so yeah. <laughs> it is Sonos. So you get the Denon version with it until they <laughs> do out of existence. So, uh, all right, well, that's our questions. Uh, I know we cow. have some amp. I know. We know I know we have some uh, reviews to tear apart, but I'll be honest with you, I can't. I'm too tired. I oh, no. I See, know. I was getting all excited because I'm like, oh, my gosh, we have enough time to do Not one doing of these. It. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't do it. I'm just, I'm literally... I'm powering through this. I'm powering through it right now. I'm just not able to make it. I love answering the questions, and I want to go through these reviews. It's just not happening tonight. I, I, right. I'm losing my voice. I feel like I'm getting sick, and I just I want to go to bed. Well, that's so, fair. That being said, 
Thank you guys for your questions. Let's keep them coming. You can always contact us at uh, avrant.com. That's the podcast webpage. You can uh, email us at rob at first. Jeez. Uh, Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Rob at avrant.com, Tom at avrant.com. You come to the we already did the website, Facebook.com slash avrant podcast. You can ask your questions there. Uh, Twitter, uh, Rob is at first reflect, and I am at avrant underscore Tom. Sure. Can Give I make us. one quick recommendation? Yeah, sure, absolutely. We've got time. Yeah, there's a, a website that's actually coming directly from the MPAA. Um, it's basically their answer to when all the pirates say, if we knew where to get stuff legally, we wouldn't use BitTorrent and we wouldn't download it illegally. So they're like, all right, we'll try and give you a site where you can plug in what you want to watch and hopefully a legal way of obtaining it will pop up for you. So that is uh, whattowatch.org. Love it. If you go what whattowatch.org, it's not necessarily always going to be streaming, but uh, if it's available to purchase or rent or stream legally online, it's supposed to show up there, and it actually seems to do a pretty good job. And oh, also okay. say I'm super duper happy because so you think you can dance got renewed for season twelve? Oh Yay! God! <laughs> I got Stop. it in there. Stop I, talking about that. I fooled you. I snuck it in there. Tom thought I wouldn't be able to, <sighs> but I I tricked him by making a recommendation. I win. <laughs> Taking advantage of my exhaustion. That's right. I don't appreciate that, sir. I'm not above that. It's sneaky Canadians. <laughs> They're sneaky. I, I, I was reading some com it was some web comic, and they called uh, Canada America's hat. <laughs> yes. That was that, is, that has been said. Has that been said? Oh, I thought they made it up. Anyways, okay. So, uh, normally we record at 9 p.m. Eastern time uh, on Tuesdays. So this week it was Wednesday. Sorry about that. We'll be back to Tuesday next week. After that, might be back on Wednesday. Not real sure. Yeah. Uh, so it's gonna our, our time's going to fluctuate. And whenever we get to the holiday season, everybody's got to be flexible. It's just the way this thing kind of rolled. <laughs> uh, we usually have a hang an after-party hangout, which uh, I may or may not start, but I certainly will not be attending for very long tonight. But generally speaking, if you really, like Galen, wanted, really wanted his question answered, came on, kind of talked to us about it, got some suggestions from the folks that were online, and then we addressed it on the podcast as well. So uh, to help everybody. So if you've got some questions that you really want answered, just hang out a little bit later. It's usually 11 p.m. Eastern time, so you can do the whatever uh, to, to whatever zone you live in. We've had people from Australia show up, uh, people from New Zealand, uh, England, all over the place. So it's uh, it's been great. Uh, for AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. All right, guys, it's going to be, uh, I'll be starting the after party in just a few seconds. Bye.